Hi, my name is Paul, and I'm an MD-PhD trainee in the Raj Lab. And I'm Jen, a clinical geneticist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and a physician scientist in the Bartolome Lab. And we're going to talk to you about our work establishing epigenetic mosaicism in a loss of imprinting mutant. The Raj Lab spends most of its time imaging individual RNA transcripts in single cells. And recently, we developed a technique that allows us to resolve single nucleotide differences in situ. Our technique, SNPFISH, is uniquely suited to studying allele-specific expression at the single cell level. So we sought to apply it to better understand imprinting, the prototypical epigenetic phenomenon where only the maternal or paternal copy of a gene is expressed, but not both. In the Bartolome lab, we've been studying imprinting for decades. In my own clinical experience, I specialize in caring for patients with disorders of imprinting. The most common imprinted region involved in human disease is the H19 IGF2 locus, where H19 is normally only expressed from the maternal chromosome and IGF2 is only expressed from the paternal chromosome. Dysregulation of this locus can lead to disorders such as Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and Russell-Silver syndrome, characterized by a broad spectrum of disease severity. This range of clinical features suggests that their genetic changes are mosaic, but it is only with SNP fish that we could observe this directly. We studied this phenomenon using a mouse model system involving crosses between two divergent mouse strains that have many SNPs between them, denoted here by orange and blue. We used SNP fish to measure the H19 expression in mouse embryonic fibroblasts, or MEFs. Here's a picture of H19 expression in a MEF. To briefly describe SNP fish, we use three different dyes, shown schematically by the gray, blue, and orange colors. The gray dye is called our guide, and it is a set of short oligonucleotides that tell along the length of H19, telling us exactly where all the H19 transcripts are in the cell. The orange and blue probes are our allele-specific SNP probes, which are specially designed to discriminate between the maternal and paternal SNPs. When there is overlap between the guide and one of the SNP probes, that means that this allele is present. So we can see in this image that the orange allele is present in this cell. If there is overlap between the guide and both SNP channels, then both alleles are present. Once we established that our assay worked well for wild-type mice, we wanted to look at an imprinting mouse mutant. Specifically, we used a mouse mutant with nine CPG sites deleted from the differentially methylated region upstream of H19. We observed through allele-specific PCR that these mutant mice exhibited biallelic expression of H19, where 60% came from the maternal allele and 40% from the paternal allele, while the paternal allele of H19 is normally silenced in the wild-type mice. The big question, though, was what was happening in each individual cell? Were they all behaving the same and expressing the 60-40 ratio? Or were some cells doing one thing and then others doing another, averaging out to the 60-40 result? When we measured expression of H19 in the mutant MEFs that are genetically identical, we saw something pretty unexpected and exciting. About a quarter of the cells were behaving as though they were wild-type MEFs, only expressing H19 from the maternal allele, while three-fourths of the cell expressed H19 from both alleles roughly evenly, as though imprinting didn't even matter for these cells at all. We were even able to see that these two subpopulations existed at the level of transcription and not just transcript abundance, where we saw transcription sites showing us uh, maternal allele transcription or biallelic cells showing transcription from both alleles. In seeing these two subpopulations, our next question was whether cells maintain their identity as either mono or biallelic over multiple cell divisions. Specifically, would a monoallelic cell give rise to other monoallelic cells? Or could a monoallelic cell give rise to biallelic cells and vice versa? To answer this question, we came up with, a, with very careful culture conditions to grow these primary MEFs into clonal clusters. We found, even as we grew these colonies from a single cell to thousands, clones would either be all monoallelic or all biallelic, showing that this is, was a heritable cell state. We were able to show that this phenomenon also occurs in tissue. Here's a tract of mouse cardiac tissue with a cluster of monoallelic cells and a cluster of biallelic cells in the same field of view. We think tissue snipfish is pretty awesome. But now the big question that remained is how these cells are different, which brings us back to the methylation. To test this directly, we grew large colonies of cells from single MEFs and then performed snipfish and imaged them to see whether they were biallelic or monoallelic clones. 
and then performed bisulfite analysis on these small samples to assay the clone's methylation status. We were able to show that yes indeed the monoallelic clones showed full wild type methylation and that the biallelic clones showed little or no methylation. This showed that methylation, a known, stable, heritable epigenetic mark, was profoundly different between these two cell clones, effectively showing us methylation at the single cell level. Moreover, we were able to show that treatment with a methylation inhibitor, 5-Aza-2-deoxycytidine, could actually shift the ratio of monoallelic to biallelic MEFs. Specifically, we were able to roughly halve the proportion of monoallelic MEFs by incubating with this methylation inhibitor demonstrating a causal link between methylation and the allele-specific expression in the single cells. This shows that methylation can determine which allele expresses at the single cell, and that stochastic defects of methylation can underlie mosaic expression patterns. So in summary, we showed that true epigenetic mosaicism underlies a loss of imprinting mutant with an effectively wild-type methylated subpopulation of cells mixed with a mutant biallelic unmethylated subpopulation of cells. This is the first demonstration of epigenetic mosaicism at the single cell level. It is really important for our understanding of imprinting disorders and specifically for their diagnosis and clinical management, as it suggests that we need assays at the single cell level in order to properly diagnose and manage these patients. Another really interesting point scientifically is that these cells are all isogenic. They all have the ex exact same 9CG mutation, and yet during development, there is some sort of stochastic bistability in methylation, with cells either remaining all or almost all their methylation or losing almost all of it. Other studies looking at methylation in cancer have shown that methylation can also there tend to be all or nothing. So it's pretty cool to see a similar phenomenon occur here. Thanks for the taking the time to listen to us. We hope you enjoyed our slidecast.